I've always been a big believer in the idea that if people can see what something is like, whether that be a different way of life, what it's like to walk in someone else's shoes, or what it's like in a specific workplace, then people will have a deeper and greater understanding of that thing. And for me, the method by which I practice that is through filmmaking. So when I got asked to do a documentary television series about healthcare, and specifically the emergency room at Vancouver General Hospital, I was immediately receptive. I figured it would be an interesting glimpse into the, what people on the front lines of healthcare experience. What is it like to be an emergency healthcare worker? Surely that specificity of experience would be as interesting as a show about crab fishermen or ice road truckers, and we know those do well. <laughs> the big challenge I assumed would be, how would I ever get anyone to agree to being on camera? I mean, how many of you would like it if I showed up at your workplace tomorrow with a camera in hand and filmed you while you're trying to get things done? But harder than trying to convince the staff, I figured, would be trying to convince patients. After all, for many people in Emerge, it may be the worst day of their lives. But I was wrong about both groups. But more on that in a moment. In the course of making the series, we profiled all sorts of things the general public don't normally hear about. Chest tubes, lighted endoscopes, seizure response dogs, touch signing, even just the presence of social workers in emergency rooms. In fact, regarding the latter, I'll be honest, Prior to my time in emergency rooms, I didn't realize there were social workers there. I remember, in fact, one of the first questions I naively asked a social worker in an emergency room was, so are you ever present when someone dies? With the worldliness of someone who has come back from a war, she answered simply, yes. <laughs> I had no appreciation for the magnitude of the understatement of that answer until over the course of the next year, I too was present when many, many people's lives ended. And that's when I got why there are social workers in emergency rooms. You need someone giving that service. And just to be clear, I saw people giving that compassion from all sorts of different staff, not just the social workers. Patients loved having a warm and interested person to talk to. And it is why I believe people were willing to consent to being filmed. They wanted to be heard, to share their story, to be listened to. When the show came out, a lot of people watched, and once that happened, people in the show got recognized. The doctors, the nurses, the staff, patient care aides, the social workers, they would get complimented by colleagues they didn't even know. Fe fellow healthcare workers in the hallways, family members, and sometimes just total strangers at the Starbucks. And when that happened, many of the staff said it was an incredible and unexpected validation for what they chose to do with their lives, something they were never consciously looking for, much less craving, but when they did get it, it really meant a lot. I suspect that feeling of acknowledgement was similar to the reason so many patients were willing to speak to me, or why it was so meaningful to patients when staff would talk to them. People like to tell their story, even on what may be one of the worst days of their life, and especially if you think it might be one of the last days of your life. So all of this made me think about death in our society and in our culture. And it made me think that we don't normally talk or think about death that much. It's always this thing that's tucked away around the corner, out of sight, out of mind. And yet, that was what was so eye-opening about spending time in an emergency room. You realize death was actually a common occurrence. Now, to be clear, the vast majority of people who come into the ER don't die, obviously, but those that do, by definition of it being an emergency room, are usually brought in with something they didn't know that they had to worry about two hours earlier. It really changes your thinking. When you see that much death, you start thinking it could be lurking around any corner. And it's not always something we lie awake at night worrying about. It might actually be a boulder out of the sky that we never saw coming. And so I guess just to really reinforce the point, I guess, in the middle of having these thoughts, the universe decided to give me a cardiac arrest. That's right, I died. I was uh, in LA, uh, we were on a break from filming and I traveled to LA for business when I dropped dead on this street, just outside LAX. My friend who I was with, Sonia Bennett, the actress, performed CPR. Paramedics arrived, took over the chest compressions. They shocked me repeatedly. They couldn't get a pulse. They shocked me a whole bunch more times. Finally, they got a pulse. 
they did a U-turn, and instead of going to the nearest county hospital where they're gonna dump me because I was just gonna be pronounced, they took me to UCLA Medical Center. I was put in a coma. I woke up three days later, miraculously without any cognitive impairment that we know of. <laughs> and they implanted an ICD in my chest. A week later, I was back in the ER, filming. In the show, we don't shy away from death. I don't really shy away from it anymore either. When you've come back from the dead, you realize it's not so abstract a thing. This feels like my second life, the life I never had any reason to expect. As a storyteller, I get used to knowing about endings. They're part of what we're trained for. If you don't understand five or six act structure, you won't make a very good screenwriter, much less documentary filmmaker. Similarly with healthcare, I kind of think we shouldn't be so solely concerned about prolonging the story. Knowing when to let someone to have a really good ending is also important. I'm not a healthcare worker, but the one thing I was able to provide in a healthcare environment was being a receptacle to people's stories. And having died and come back, I'm incredibly comfortable talking about death with strangers. It no longer scares me or makes me uncomfortable since, well, I pretty much feel I should be dead. And sometimes the most sought after care or treatment a patient was seeking, that, was, was seeking was that human contact. Ironically, many of the amazing people I met at VGH were good at that. But it also seemed like something all these remarkably, remarkable people did extracurricularly, despite the design of the system, not because of it. There absolutely should be better palliative care. Every death should have emphasis on dignity. But I also think that culturally, we should be better at embracing endings. It's not always a failure. We all die. So in closing, my hope for healthcare is twofold that we get as good talking about death as we do health, and that we all learn the value of listening to a patient's story. Sometimes the latter is as important as any treatment, and I think we may just savor the story more if we knew the ending could occur anytime. Thank you.